In this video, I'm going to cover isomers of coordination compounds. So compounds that have the same formula but different structures, there's different ways that we can have isomers. We can have structural isomers or stereoisomers. Structural isomers have atoms with different connectivities, which means that um, when we look at the bonding pattern, we might have four different carbon atoms. Um, atom, when we have structural isomers, we can say that uh, when we draw the bonding pattern from atom to atom, they're different. So for example, in one structure, I might have carbon one is bonded to carbon two, which is bonded to carbon three, which is bonded to carbon four. And in another structure, I might have carbon one is bonded to carbon two, which is bonded to carbon three, but carbon four is bonded to two and not three. So structural isomers have different connections. So the atoms actually, the bonding pattern of the atoms is different. There's different ways that we can have structural isomers. There's different categories of structural isomers. We can have uh, coordination isomers, where the ligand and counter ion exchange place, or we can have linkage isomers, where the ligand coordinates to the metal in different ways. So this is kind of like uh, an example of, um, these are specific to uh, complex ions, uh, coordination isomers and linkage isomers. But this is kind of like a linkage isomer in a way, right? So the four is either linked to three or the four is linked to two. Um, the coordination isomer is if I have a complex ion in here, right? I won't draw anything specific, but I've got my complex in here. And part of my complex has Cl in it. And outside, to balance the charge on my complex, I have brom bromide. Coordination isomer is where this bromide and this chloride can change places because they're pretty similar. Remember, they're both halogens and they both have a minus one charge. So if the bromide somehow comes in here and now it's part of the complex, but the Cl minus comes out here to be the counter ion, they can swap, they can trade places. We call those coordination isomers, when a ligand and an outside ion swap places like that. All right, and now stereoisomers are um, isomers when, when atoms have the same connections, but different spatial arrangements. So we have seen coordination compounds um, and uh, molecules in the past that have a geometry that's called square planar. And so remember in a square planar geometry I have uh, four bonds and they all have 90 degree bond angles. So maybe I have a bonding pattern in one compound that looks like this. And maybe I have a bonding pattern in another compound another square planar compound that looks like this. So in one compound, the A's are 90 degrees apart. And in the other compound, the A's are 180 degrees apart. So otherwise, all the atoms are the same. So if we gave give this one a letter 2, we'll call it C, then we would say that the formula of this compound here is C A to B 2. And what's the com what's the and what is the uh, formula for this compound here? Well, it's C A two B two. So it's the same formula for both compounds, um, but these are different compounds because here the A's are 90 degrees apart and here the A's are 180 degrees apart. So even though these two compounds have the same formula and they also have the same connections, right? We said structural isomers, the atoms have different connections. So here, if I were to give these numbers in the same way, let's just call them one and two and B1 and B2, 
A1 and A2, B1 and B2, and we call this C1, just so we can indicate which atoms are which. If I were to describe the connections, I would say A1 is bonded to C1, A2 is bonded to C1, B1 is bonded to C1, B2 is bonded to C1. And how would I describe this? I would say A1 is bonded to C1, A2 is bonded to C1, B1 is bonded to C1, and B2 is bonded to C1. So the connections, the, connect, the connectivities between all the atoms are the same. They're all bonded to C1. But somehow these are still different compounds, so they don't fit in this category. They fit in this category. Their ligands have different spatial arrangements. So these are 90 degrees apart, these are 180 degrees apart. They're different spatial arrangements. So we would call this uh, cis and trans. Um, we can also have another type that we'll see in a minute that's similar that we call fac and mer. And finally, the last category of isomers are called optical isomers. And optical isomers are the most subtle and the most difficult to distinguish. Um, I would say structural isomers are probably the easiest. We can see, oh, the, the carbon is either, is either bonded to carbon 2 or C3 is bonded to carbon 4. That's pretty easy to see the difference in those shapes. Geometric isomers are a little bit more difficult because the shapes aren't really different. The bond angles are slightly different. And optical isomers are the hardest of all because the bond angles are all the same but still the compounds are different and the way that they're different is because they're like your left hand and your right hand. So your left hand, if you look at your left hand and your right hand right now, and you can look at the backs of them or you can look at the palms, um, you can see that they are almost identical to each other. Uh, when you put them palm to palm, they fit next to each other really well. They're, um, in fact, we would call them mirror images of each other. But we would also say that your hands are non-superimposable mirror images because we put them right next to each other palm to palm. You can see that indeed your hands are mirror images of each other. But in, to superimpose your hands means to line up your middle fingers together and to put the, the backs of your, you know, to put the palm of one hand on the back of the other hand. To superimpose them is to make them the same in those planes, right? So um, when I line up my fingers that way, I've got my middle finger is lined up, but my index finger and my ring finger are, are switched. My pinky and my thumbs are switched. So when I try to stick them together like that, I try to superimpose them, the palm of one hand on the back of the other, they're opposites. They don't fit together that way. They fit together when I put my thumbs and thumbs together, but in that way they're, they're really mirror images. So another way to think about this is your feet are the same way, right? Your feet look really, really similar to each other. In fact, they're mirror images in the same way that your hands are, but if you try to put your feet on top of each other, the toes are switched. They don't, they don't, they, they are non-superimposable. And the way that you can prove that this is true is try to put your right foot in your left shoe or try to put your left foot in your right shoe. Although the, they are mirror images of each other and your feet are nearly identical, they are obviously different because your left foot does not fit in your right shoe and your right foot does not fit in your left shoe. So non-superimposable images of each other, your left foot and your right foot, are different. Non-superimposable mirror images of molecules, those that are otherwise identical and very very difficult to determine that they are different at all because they are literally as similar as your left hand and your right hand if we can determine that they are actually non superimposable mirror images then they're different because they're like left feet a left foot and a right foot and they're not going to fit in a left shoe and a right shoe so they're different molecules we call those optical isomers All right, so structural isomers are molecules that have the same number and type of atoms, but they're attached in a different order. So we saw that C4 is connected to C2, or C4 is connected to C3. The, the connectivity of the atoms is different. And stereoisomers are molecules that have the same connection, same number and type, they're attached in the same order, so the same connectivity, but the atoms or groups of atoms point in a different spatial direction. 
so the bond angles are different. Um, although the connections are the same, all, the atoms are all connected to the same atoms in both molecules, the bond angle might be 90 or the bond angle might be 180, um, or the bond angles might all be exactly the same. They might be identical between the isomers, but they're as different as your left hand and your right hand, and they don't fit on top of each other. And we call those stereo isomers. Okay, so here's an example of a linkage isomer. So a linkage isomer is one where the connections are different. Right here I've got the either this oxygen atom, uh, this is nitrogen actually, this nitrogen atom is connected to the cobalt, or this is, this is a ligand here, right? So the ligands are the ones that supply the electrons to the metal center. So the electrons in this bond right here that's holding this nitrogen atom to the cobalt, the electrons right here came from nitrogen. So in, when this ligand is attached to cobalt like this, the bond could break and the electrons would go back to nitrogen and this thing kind of flips itself around because nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons that it can donate and be a Lewis base and oxygen also has a lone pair of electrons and it can donate and be a Lewis base. So there are two different atoms on the same ligand. These bonds here are strong, they're not going to break, these covalent bonds here but there are two different atoms on the same ligand that can both make bonds to the central metal atom. If the nitrogen is making the bond, then this is called the nitro isomer. And we know that it's different because it's kind of yellow. And this is, if the oxygen is bonded of this nitro ligand, if the oxygen atom is bonded instead, we call that the nitrito isomer. And it's kind of red or, or darker orange. And so these compounds have different melting points, they have different solubilities, they have different colors, they are different compounds, they have different properties, they do different things. And so um, although the, all the atoms are exactly the same, that's why we call them isomers, none of the atoms changed, the only thing that changed was this group kind of flipped around and instead of making a bond to N, it makes a bond to O. And that's, that's uh, one way in which compounds can be isomers of each other. Here are ligands that are capable of this linkage isomerization. So the one we just saw is um, this nitro group here, NO3 or nitrite, uh, I guess it's NO2 minus. NO2 minus, this nitrite group, um, it, can grew, it can bond from the uh, electrons on nitrogen, the lone pair on nitrogen, we would call that a nitro in the nomenclature if we were trying to name that compound. Um, of course we couldn't just do it from the formula like we did in a previous video where we're given a formula and we're trying to give the name. We would actually have to see a picture of this structure and we'd have to see the in which, in which way it's bonded. So we would have to see does the bond to the central metal ion go from nitrogen or does it go from oxygen? We need that information in order to call it nitro or uh, nitrito. Um, here's another ligand that can make bonds from different atoms. This is the cyano that we've seen in a previous example. But again, in that example, we don't know if we were looking at the cyano isomer or the isocyano isomer. We know that the cyano ligand was part of the complex, but we don't know if the carbon was making a bond to the central metal ion or if the nitrogen was making a bond to the central metal ion. That changes the properties and it changes the compound and it changes the name. Here is another ligand that can do this. Uh, this ligand here has an oxygen and a carbon and a nitrogen and the two different atoms that can bond are the nitrogen, has a lone pair it can donate, two, but it would only donate l one lone pair, remember. And oxygen has two lone pairs, but it would only donate one. So depending on whether the nitrogen or oxygen donates a lone pair to the central metal ion, this compound would have different properties and a different name. Uh, cyanato or isocyanato. And here's thiocyanato. It's the same uh, same compound with a C and an N except the oxygen and sulfur, the oxygen has been replaced by a sulfur. So again now it can bond from the sulfur or the nitrogen. So 
uh, these are just different ligands that are capable of linkage isomerization and there's more and in general what you're looking for are are there m two different atoms on this link on this ligand that have lone pairs that they can donate if so then it's possible that each different atom could be involved in a different isomer of that compound one where it's bonded to N or one where it's bonded to O Um, here are some examples of geometric isomers in coordination compounds. So again, geometric isomers are stereoisomers that differ in the spatial orientation of the ligands. So here we can't say the same thing about the connection. So there we said either the N is bonded to the metal or the O is bonded to the metal. Here we have two chlorines bonded to the metal and two nitrogens bonded to the metal. Here we have two chlorines bonded to the metal and two nitrogens bonded to the metal. So the difference between these isomers is something different. It's not the con it's not the connectivities, it's not the connection of the atoms. In this case, it's their arrangement in space, their orientation. So here the chlorine atoms being right next to each other, that gives us 90 degree angle in this square planar complex. And the chloride atoms being across from each other like this gives us 180 degree angle between the chlorides in this complex. So again, that's going to give us a different color. Potentially, it's going to give us a different melting point, different solubilities. These will have different properties in their different compounds. We call this one cis. They're cis when they are um, next to each other, and they're trans when they're across from each other. Um, so in cis-trans isomerization, two identical ligands are either adjacent to each other or opposite to each other in the structure. So again, we can see that here in a square planar structure. The chlorines are, are next to each other, 90 degrees, or the chlorines are apart from each other, 180. And we can also see it here in a compound that has a coordination number of six. So this is an octahedral complex. And here again, the chlorines can be next to each other, occupying these two spaces, two of the six, and that would give us a bond angle of 90. Or the chlorines can be here and here, occupying these two spaces of the six, and that would give us a bond angle of 180. So um, these are different compounds. We would call this one cis, again, and this one trans, because they're across from each other. They have the same formula, they have the same connections, but they're different compounds because the arrangement of these atoms is different. If I have three of the same atom, so there, in that case I had two of the same atom, we would call those cis and trans. If I have three of the same atom, three chlorides, then I can have a similar kind of isomerism where I can have the three chlorides, each of which are, are 90 degrees apart from each other. So this chloride is 90 degrees away from this one, this chloride is 90 degrees away from this one, and this chloride is 90 degrees away from this one. They're all not, their relationships are all 90, 90, 90. And then we call this isomer the uh, FAC uh, isomer, which um, is short for face, because we're saying that this face of the molecule is occupied by chlorine atoms, and so this is the face isomer, the FAC isomer. So this one, I have two chlorine atoms that are 180 degrees apart from each other, and these two are 90 degrees, and these two are 90 degrees. So the way that we would tell these apart, the way that we can see that this molecule is different than this one, is to go about it the same way that I was just going about it, which is to look at the bond angles between the atoms. In this compound, all the bond angles are 90. And in this compound, this bond angle is 180, so it's not the same as this. It has to be a different compound, even though all of the atoms are the same. So the way that we, this, this specific kind of isomerism, we call fac mer, um, and this is the face, and this is the, uh, the meridian, right? Or we would sometimes call, uh, this, this one says forms an arc around the center, but we might say that this is the meridian, and so, that's where the MER comes from, the face and the meridian. Um, but these are similar to cis-trans in, in that the way that they are different is that their bond angles are different. 
And finally, again, here's the most subtle of all, the optical isomers. In these, the bond angles between all of the atoms are the same. There are two different isomers. The atoms are all the same between the isomers. The bond angles are all the same between the isomers, yet they are two different compounds. So these are optical isomers. These are mirror images, your left hand and your right hand. They're, they are left-handed and right-handed versions of molecules, literally. So um, um, they're called optical isomers, and they are stereoisomers that are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. So uh, here is an example. This is, we've seen this, um, this ligand before. Let's, let me go back really quick to show what this is. This is an ethylene diamine ligand, and there's two nitrogen atoms from the same ligand that are stuck to the cobalt. Remember, this is a bidentate ligand. And this bridge right here that's yellow, this is made of carbon and hydrogen atoms. So let's go back and look at a, a more detailed version of this triethylene diamine um, isomer. This one is kind of a cartoon version to show us how the connections work to make these two molecules different, the left-handed and right-handed version of each other. But just to show us exactly what we're looking at, I want to go look at the ethylene diamine ligand again. Here we go. So here's the cobalt. Here's a nitrogen atom. So this is right here. This is one ethylene diamine ligand right here. Remember, this is a ligand that can bond to the cobalt twice. It bonds to the cobalt once right here, and it bonds to the cobalt again right here. It's a bidentate ligand. So um, this is NH2, CH2, CH2, N. H2. So an ethylene diamine ligand has two NH2 groups and two CH2 groups. All right, and there's one of them here, one of them right here, and one of them right here. And so in the cartoon we just saw, these CH2 groups are replaced by that yellow ribbon, and the CH2 groups here are replaced by a yellow ribbon, and so on. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, so now we know what we're looking at, ethylene diamine ligands on a cobalt center. The yellow part is that CH2, those CH2 atoms that have been replaced by this, this ribbon just to show us that this ligand and this ligand are connected. It's a bidentate ligand. So the way that they're connected like this, if I make a mirror image of this molecule, believe it or not, because it kind of has like one that goes back one that goes down and to the right, and one that goes to the front and to the left, right? If we consider these to be kind of like propellers, they kind of look like propellers, right? Well, the way that these propellers are angled, if we look at the mirror image of it, then we're actually going to have propellers that are angled in the opposite direction. And if we bring that mirror image down here and try to put, try to superimpose the mirror image on top of this one in the same way that you would try to superimpose your left hand on top of your right hand, you would see that for this particular molecule, they don't fit. They're non-superimposable. So maybe uh, you can think about this like propellers. If you think about like a, the propeller from a boat, if you're familiar, they ha it has these blades, and the blades are kind of curved one direction. Well, they're curved in that direction because the engine is made to spin in a certain direction, clockwise for example. And if the engine is spinning clockwise and you want that motor to propel you forward, then the blades have to be designed in a specific way to move with this clockwise direction and propel you forward. If the blades were designed backwards, then a clockwise motion would propel you backwards instead of propelling you forwards. So the angle of the blades is actually making, your, you would, could have a, a right-handed propeller and a left-handed propeller, depending on whether the motion of the motor was clockwise or counterclockwise, and whether it would propel you forward and backward. So these two compounds are actually different. We can have an ethylene, uh, this cobalt, triethylene diamine cobalt-3 is what we would call this. Um, 
there are two versions of triethylene diamine cobalt-3. There's this left-handed version and there's this right-handed version. So if I made this compound in the lab, then I would potentially get a mixture of this and this because they would be made, I would be make, I would be putting these propellers on this cobalt and they might go on to have a left-handed orientation and they might go on to have a right-handed orientation. It would be random. All right, so let's try some examples. Draw the following compound. What is its geometry? Okay, so we've got an iron in the center. It's our iron is our transition metal, the coordination metal. We have uh, how many total ligands do we have? Four plus two. So we have six total ligands. And remember, when I have a coordination number of six, the geometry is going to be octahedral. And the way that they go is that they're all 90 degrees apart from each other. right? So then sometimes we draw this to show it's going backwards as a dashed line. And sometimes I draw this to show it's going forwards as a bold line, like this. Um, and the cobalt ligands, or excuse me, this is not cobalt. It's not capital C, lowercase o. This is capital C, capital O. This is carbon monoxide. So this is an oxygen. It's not cobalt. This is carbon and oxygen. So that is one of those ligands that, remember, could potentially be a, have linkage isomerism. It could bond from the C or it can bond from the O. So we don't know which isomer we're drawing here. So we'll just draw them in general. It'll just say CO, 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 and I can draw it like this. I have four of those, and then I have two CLs. So I can draw the CLs like this and like this. OK, so draw the following compound. I drew it. What is its geometry? Its geometry, the coordination number is 6, and the geometry is octahedral. So what type of isomers are possible for this compound? So right now, if we look at the relationships, I have uh, carbon monoxide is 180 degrees away from carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is 90 degrees away from carbon monoxide. I also have carbon monoxide being I also have carbon monoxide being 90 degrees away from chlorine on this side and 90 degrees from chlorine on this side. And in fact, all the carbon monoxides are 90 degrees away from chlorine. And now I look at the chlorine, the chloride atoms themselves, the chlorine atoms themselves, and they are 180 degrees apart from each other. They're on opposite sides of this octahedral complex. So what type of isomers are possible? Well, to think about the, the different ways, the different isomers that are possible, I would think about the different ways that I can arrange these, the different relationships they can have. So the only possible relationships in an octahedral complex are 90 degrees like this, or 180 degrees like this. Those are the only two types of bond angles that we have in an octahedral complex. So in this orientation, the carbon monoxide is 90 degrees apart, and the carbon monoxide is 180 degrees apart. The carbon monoxide already has both relationships, 90 and 180. So I can't, there's no conceivable way in which I could position all four of them so that they would only be 90. And there's no conceivable way that I could position all four of them so that they would only be 180. Um, that's not physically possible to do. So there's no, I can't move the COs in any different placement than they already have. Everywhere I try to put them from where they are will effectively be equal um, with the exception of one move, because if I make one move, then I can put them in a different place while also putting the chlorides in a different relationship. So right now I have two 180 degree relationships, right? Carbon monoxide is 180 degrees apart from here. Carbon monoxide is 180 degrees apart from here. And chloride is 180 degrees apart from here. So I can draw another version of this molecule where I have CO, CO. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to swap this and this. I'm going to, oops, I already drew it wrong then. I'm going to take this one right here and this one right here and swap them. So now this is going to be Cl, Co, and this one back here is going to be Co, and this is Co, and this one up front is still Cl. 
So I swapped these two. And then I made this one. So what I did was I took this relationship right here that's 180 degrees. And now I have this relationship here, and it's going to be hard to draw it because I am not a good artist. But let's see, it's going to go like this and like this. There we go. That's my 90 degree angle between those groups. This group is popping out of the board. So here's my 90 degree angle. So it went from 180 degrees between chlorides to 90 degrees between chlorides. And I can also see that the relationship between the carbon monoxides changed. I had two 180 degree relationships, one of them right here and one of them right here. And now I only have one 180 degree relationship between COs because these are 90 and these are 90 and these are 90 and these are 90 and so on and so on. They're, they're all 90. The only ones that are 180 are these two right here. So sometimes when I fl flip two groups around I can turn one stereoisomer into another stereoisomer. That's a good place to start. Just draw any old arrangement of the groups that you want. Put the ligands in any position that you want and then flip two of them around and look at what you generated and see if it's different in some way. These two are different. Now if I flip two more of them around, what's going to happen at that point? Well, I could take, uh, if I flip any of the COs around, that's not going to matter, right? CO for CO. If, I, if those trade places, it doesn't do anything. If these trade places, it doesn't do anything. So I can flip this CL and this CO. And if I do that, then I would get a CL and a CL that are 90 degrees apart. Right? Or I can flip this CL with this CO, and if I do that, I'd get one that's 90 degrees apart. Or this one with this one, and I'd get C two CLs that are 90 degrees apart. So any of those changes would just be recreating this same molecule. If the CLs are 90 degrees apart, then that molecule is always the same, because all the relationships of all the groups are always the same. But this molecule and this molecule are different because this relationship is 180 and this relationship is 90. So what type of isomers are possible? Well, we call this one trans. And we call this one cis. So cis, cis, trans, isomerism. And how many isomers are there? There are two isomers for this compound. There are two different ways that we can arrange these. Now, of course, that's ignoring linkage isomers. There are more than two, comp two, more than two isomers. If I realize that we can put linkage up here too, if we put linkage are also a type of isomer up here, then it might be the C that's bonded here or the O that's bonded here. And it could be, and it could be C versus O for all four of these. So there's actually many, many, many more types of isomers possible. So if we're just thinking about cis and trans, then there's two isomers. There's this one, cis, and this one, trans. But if we're thinking about linkage isomers, there's many possible. There's one isomer where there's a C bonded here, and all of these are bonded at the O. There's an isomer where this one's a C, and this one's a C, and these two are O's. There's an isomer where this one's a C and this one's a C and these two are O's and so on and so on and so on. There are very there are lots and lots of different isomers if we consider linkage isomers also. All right, let's look at this one. NiCl2Br2. So, draw the following compound. What is its geometry? So, we know that nickel goes in the middle and I have 4 total ligands, two and two. Now we have a problem because when I have four total ligands, I can draw them like this. Let's just ignore where the BR and CL are for now, but I can draw it like this with 90 degree angles, or I can draw them like this with 109 degree angles. Right? Remember with, with four with a coordination number of four, there are two possible geometries. We could have square planar.
or we can have tetrahedral. So which of these is it for this particular compound? Well, we will learn in the next video when we look at crystal field theory that um, when the central metal atom has a D8 arrangement of electrons, then it tends to be a square planar complex. But if it's not D8, then it tends to be a tetrahedral complex. When we look at the electron configuration of nickel, it does not have that D8 configuration that we'll get into later. So it's actually tetrahedral. It's not square planar. So this is an important thing to consider though. When our ion has four ligands, it might be either. And we, have, we need more information to determine whether it's square planar or tetrahedral. So given that it's tetrahedral, what type of isomers are possible for this compound? Well, we could have optical isomers in a tetrahedral compound if every ligand is different. If I have one, two, three, four ligands that are all different than each other, then we could have an optical isomer here. In this case, I don't have that situation. I have one and two are the same, and then three and four are the same. So since I have a tetrahedral complex um, and I don't have four different ligands, I only have two different ligands. Then if I try to do that trick where I take any two ligands and flip them around, what I would see is that here, right now, all of the atoms have a 109.5 degree bond angle. Because a tetrahedral complex, all of these angles are 109.5. So if I swap this one and this one, what were their bond angles all be? 109.5. If I swap this one and this one, what will the angles all be? 109.5. So tetrahedral compounds generally do not have isomers unless all four of these are different. If all four of the atoms that are bonded to the middle are different, then I can have a left-handed and right-handed situation, which is not intuitive. And it really helps to build a three-dimensional model prove to yourself that that's the case um, because it doesn't seem like they would be left-handed and right-handed but when they're tetrahedral and I have one two three four that's the situation that we have so in this case how, what type of isomers are possible well optical isomers are possible but how many isomers are there for this actual compound there's only one this is the only isomer there is because um, we're only because we can't flip these around in any way that is going to make this different because there's only two different ligands not four different ligands alright let's look at this last one um, platinum 2 NH3 2 BRs alright so at first glance this looks very similar PT we have four ligands, NH3, NH3. This does not have linkage isomerism. It can't bond from the N or the H. It can only bond from the N. So it might be square planar because I have four, or it might be tetrahedral because I have four. I, it's, I need more information. I have to look at uh, the electron configuration of the metal atom. So again, what determines whether it's square planar with 90 degree bond angles or tetrahedral with 109.5 degree bond angles is whether the central metal ion is D has D8 electron configuration. And, and platinum does have D8 electron configuration. So platinum is not tetrahedral. Platinum is square planar. So given that we have a square planar complex, now, if I look at the relationship between the atoms, I have 90 degree bond angle between bromines and a 90 degree bond angle between ammonia atoms. Can I flip this in such a way, take two groups and swap them, and make a different compound? Well, yes I can. If I swap a bromine and an NH3, then I get 
I make a compound like this. And the difference is in here, 90 degrees and 90 degrees between similar groups. And here, my similar groups are 180 degrees apart and 180 degrees apart. So we would call this compound cis, and we would call this compound trans. So the types of possible isomers here are cis-trans. There is no linkage isomerism possible here. So how many isomers are there? Well, there's the cis isomer and there's the trans isomer. There are two isomers possible for this compound.